just for locating the committee. Okay, committee, you may be getting out very early today. When we ran into the snag with the insurance bill, I canceled the e-cigarette testimony because I didn't want a lot of people traipsing up here and us not getting to them, you know, until 2 or 3 o'clock on a Friday. But since then, um, I had a meeting with the Chair of Appropriations this morning, trying to figure out what we do with S96. And yeah, we're already out of that. The best, I, it needs to come out of here ASAP because it needs to go to a probes because there's money appropriated but not raised. There is money being worked on to be raised in the other body. So what I've been asked to do is just pass it out, let appropriations deal with it, but it is going to have to be dealt with as part of that entire end game because the only new money in there is the $8 million from the inheritance tax. And whether or not What's that? it's, no, it's yeah. what, it's, no, that's what the governor's funding plan is. There is no alternative funding plan in here. There is a proposal. A probes, therefore, has to find a way to fund it. Um, so, so anyway, we're just being asked to pass it out. We can do what we did last year without recommendation and send it to a probes because it's going to be part of the bigger money mix at the end. We're going to have to come up to even meet the governor's 48, I guess now 50 million number. We're going to have to replace the $8 million he's booked from the estate tax, because that is also generally booked in the budget. And we probably won't like what he took out in the budget. Um, and there will be a funding, they're working on a funding source, and I've asked to have some numbers calculated on some funding source I've thought of um, when it comes back with a funding what source. What might those sources be? I'm, I'm looking, I think we're all looking at the present uh, property tax surcharge and transfer, property transfer tax, yes, property transfer tax. That's been the only thing we've done to fund it, to raise new money. I think the House is looking at raising that, uh, that surcharge. My feeling is now that the surcharge, which started out as a one or two year, has been made permanent, we probably ought, and it hits everybody. I would like to look at what it would, you know, what kind of money would generate by maybe doing more, folding it all in, just saying, yeah, this is the property transfer tax, and maybe do, uh, tiering it. Doesn't have anything to do with water. Or, or well, it never did. <laughs> well, but those were. With, with all, are you guys living in a historic way? Yes. <laughs> we've we, been we through these had, battles before. Well, the funding sources that we've had, have, we've always been reassured that these were temporary as we worked yes. to get a, like a better word, proper program up and running that, that coordinated water use and taxation, et cetera, et cetera. So. Right. So and we no one knows what that yet. is. We, we passed something out of here. Yeah. Well, actually, we did a occupancy tax at one point in this committee to fund initially. I voted out of the Somebody. People want to look at the clean lake, don't they? 
That's why right. Why they come here? If there was another um, form of interim until we get things up and running. Paid occupancy taxes to Never build was. stadiums, <laughs> redevelop downtowns. Um, you know, we. So. But we need to get it out. If it's going to survive and keep moving, it needs to go, and it needs to go to a probes. I'd like to make a motion that yeah. Senator Brock's Well, I think Senator Brock's got well, yeah, That's just a question. It's regarding uh, the, uh, Senator Rockin's bill uh, that raises additional uh, money on the property transfer tax from corp these corporate transfers that have been yeah. in the loopholes, whether they will wind up getting included in this if we don't have some language excluding it, assuming we may want to do that because some folks have already got that eye on that money for some other purpose. Well, we haven't seen Senator Sorotkin's bill, it's, so I don't know what I'm excluding. It's coming well, we in, it didn't come out. Oh, it's in another version. We've actually talked about it here, too, right? yeah, as a but, second standalone. Right. Yeah. I think that's sort of idea. the point, right? Is all of this has to fit together. Yeah, right. It's well, all the good. Question, is there anything we should do with that here before it goes over there with that? Well, in you know, we haven't even that seen it, so to exclude it without seeing it would be difficult. Central but if we well, vote to send it out and we vote to use that money, that will exclude it. And it will come out, because that, is that going to approach to? Which one, the housing bill? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so approach will get all of them. Yes, they will. Okay. But that one will come here first? Or? Yes. So, yes. if I might, Madam Chair, and I, I, given that I don't, there are multiple people here who sit on natural resources, or have sat on natural resources in the past, and are probably more up to speed on what has happened prior to this. I, I just need a little bit more explanation of why we're at this point of passing a bill that has no Funding, I, I don't understand. Yeah. The so if natural resource, it is my understanding, could not reach agreement on how to pay for this. Do they have agreement on how much money was needed? Yeah, uh, and I would say, I think we just felt in the end, Senator McDonald, if I'm wrong, this was really a finance decision around money, okay. uh, how we would raise yeah. it. But as I'm understanding from the chair right now, that we have a couple different ways to do this, that House Ways and Means is working on some funding options. So this definitely isn't the end of the story. Um, and uh, whatever they might send us, we might add to it. Uh, give us more time to take testimony and learn about some of the different options yeah. out there. Uh, and there's a timing issue. Yeah, so I think ideally, yeah. in an ideal yeah. world, I, ha uh, Senate Natural Resources and Energy maybe. might have sent this to us Two, three weeks ago, okay. we would yeah. have time. Yeah. Last so that's, year, I, if I'm misrepresenting yeah, something. Yeah, no, last year we went through the same process. We got two strike alls sent to us, I think, two days before crossover. And we sent it out without recommendation. Right. And a third one presented in here. And we, yeah, had like okay. two hours to do it. And I know that Mark wants to say something, but I don't want to forget my thread of like how yeah. much money. Senator Campion is, is yeah. correct. The we we did um, it seemed to be a consensus that we we're going to go with the maintenance of effort number mm -hmm. that they presented, and we didn't debate that. In the committee we talked about per parcel fees and whether everybody <coughs> with a parcel paid the same or they were connected to uh, how much you know uh, permeable surfaces, but we didn't. Uh, we didn't um, persevere to vote on that, on any of those things. Mm -hmm. And we sent it here to the committee who raises money. And um, if we don't raise it here, it's going to come from somewhere else. Um, right now, or the, not at all. Yeah, the administration has $48 million. And we've got the numbers here. The last year, we, we looked up last year's bill and what it basically said was there was a study that you know we should look at how much we should spend which would include but there was no commitment last year i think we spent 56 million this year the administration has 48 books we have been told that the reason it came down is there were several major 
uh, water, like filtration, water, sewer projects that were done, Rutland, Chittenden. Um, and so that money's been spent and that good is there and therefore this year it's lower. So there's 48 million on the table to do what we did last year plus inflation I would take, I'm trying to remember his numbers, I think it was like another, it, it comes up to about 15, because included in that 48 is 8 million from the estate, from the estate tax, which has last year and before that gone to the general fund. So the general fund has to cut $8 million. What's in the budget is 57 million, 811, 342. Yeah. Yeah, we've got that document. And, but, uh, that's the other bill we're doing today. Um, so we are, sh we are, if you don't want, if you want to exclude the, um, the uh, estate tax, we are approximately 14, 15 million dollars short. We're not changing the estate tax. That, the governor has also booked changing the estate tax, which that hasn't happened either. That we will have to do. Um, and we have not done that. Is he proposing uh, yeah. more money? No, he is proposing to raise the threshold of the estate tax so it would bring in less money. So yes, the, uh, the to. This is not traditionally our role. No, it is not. What, what's <coughs> Which part? Pardon? What part is not our role? The chair of appropriations came in and said we've got revenues coming in, we don't need the money. Um, please don't raise any money on to clean up the water. Or are we just, are we going to do what the last committee did, which was to say we're not going to, we're going to pass along to someone else to make this decision? Or, or are we to start? Or are we going to say, at this moment, we're not going to Well, in which case, uh, so what he would say is that we, we wouldn't <coughs> suggest to ourselves that uh, we, the solutions have already been planned, unless no. they have been already planned. So. No, the solutions are not planned. We have been asked to keep this bill alive, mm -hmm. to get it over to appropriations. Because we'll be receiving miscellaneous tax with some ideas. We that will get the miscellaneous tax. My understanding is that water funding is not on there. Yeah. When they send the water bill over, Ways and Means is working on ways to fund it. They work all day and they don't do insurance and banking. So they just traditionally have been able to do deeper digs into things like this. So we're being asked to keep it alive. Right now, <coughs> the big question is the eight million that a probes will have to come up with. And so we need to get it to them. Yeah, no, I respect that. I appreciate you coming along because I don't want it to. I don't I mean, think anyone wants it. No, I know. Yeah. And we have not had time. I know there's some concern about the regional planning commissions, um, you know, and how well vetted that all is. I'm a little concerned that I'm not seeing any new money going to them. Um, but I don't have well, time. Well, there, we heard the. Yeah, we heard. They said they, they had that when they do grants or contracts that there's, there's an, yeah, you can put a 10% overhead cost. That's fine. But we haven't done these water grants before, right? Well, I, if you don't mind, Mr. Yeah. I'd ask Mr. O'Grady just to come up so I don't misspeak All right. this. Just to get I just, you know, if we are not putting new money in and we are going to be doing grants to the RPCs and we aren't raising new money, then what aren't we doing? So the grant amounts will have up to 
available to do uh, administrative costs. Right. So the RPCs are, are going to be getting new right. money. Um, they are, but what isn't getting old money? But, well, that's your decision because that's what part of appropriating money from the Clean Water Fund oh, is going okay, to be about. So that's right? why. So that's what appropriations will look at, and, and, okay. and that's the yearly yearly deliberation that you have about how to spend from the Clean Water Fund. It's typically based on the recommendations of the Clean Water Board, um, and they have with when this mechanism goes into place. They will be making recommendations for the four grant programs that are in it, and then it's up to you to okay. fund. So those are the grant programs they're talking about. Yes. Okay. The RPCs are have been are, are now basin <laughs> committees. Right. And the basin committees will make recommendations within their own basins as to who the winners and the losers are on the grants. And they will make those recommendations to the Clean Water Board, which will either approve, deny, or rearrange those local recommendations, um, and then recommend make their recommendations uh, in the governor's budget. Okay, that's what so the, what will take place. The uh, concept then is that. The RPCs will work with the basin, basin, the basin advisory council. Okay, this is all Greek to those of us that do insurance and banking. Okay, uh, C whips, C whips, C I. Okay. They will not be able to just. So the idea is that they will just be almost a pass through <coughs> to get the money out. The yeah. Well, yeah. Basin committees that are actually doing the work. They're passed through, but they are um, expected and required to be the ones that are going to oversee the operation and management and efficacy of okay. the projects funded through the grants. Okay. And they are limited in their, the amount they can use. Right. To the, do that. the Senate Natural Resources Committee was very clear that there was a. 15% cap on administrative costs on all of those grants and through the process. So the big block grant goes to the RPC and the RPC starts making the little grants out. 15% limit is on that as well. The C loops. Not the RPC. Our, we know what our RPCs are. The right. Clean water service provider. Right. And the regional planning commissions are separate entities from the New, a new government created. They, they may be group one in the that state. will make recommendations. Okay. So the key point that I brought up the other day, or one of the points, is the operation and management cost of those projects that are funded by the grants over time. I think you heard from the Secretary of Natural Resources that the budget doesn't account for that. Right. And she said, well, the regulatory programs, they don't fund operation and management, which is true. Many of you have been on institutions or have been on part of this committee. Right. You don't fund operation and management for the, the capital funds that go out to the water treatment. Yeah. 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 You don't do that. But those are regulatory programs. Remember, these projects are above and beyond the regulatory program. And so, will the cost be borne by the RPC in doing the operation and management over time of that project? Will it mean that less money is, is accounted for in the grant for the capital, the hard cost of the project? That, that, that is, that is what is not accounted for in this. Right. S96 says that their money should be available, but this Does not have doesn't it. have that in it. This is just building the ditch, but it's not talking about who's responsible to make sure the ditch stays right. clear, that it doesn't, yeah. Right. 
So that that's a question for but, across the hall as well. But and there is adequate money to do a lot of this. Maybe not to do the same amount we did last year plus inflation, which is I know the ideal. But I think we we don't even know what it would cost to fund the ongoing maintenance of management and maintenance of all I mean, we're talking a lot, potentially a lot of small programs. So. Um, one thing that I'm curious about is the money that's contemplated after we send the money out in this bill to the whatever the regional entities. What is left for like is that spending all of this money or or do we get half of the money and the state has direct responsibility over the other half or I just not understand that relationship. So Remember that that all the money that's available for clean water doesn't all come from the clean water fund. There's the transportation monies, there's the capital monies from EPA for drinking water and clean water. There's the capital monies from NRCS for IPMPs. They're they're not they're not going to be affected by the, the, those pots are still going to be there. Maybe I should ask you this question: What? How much money is going out the door in these total these right? That's going to be up to you based on the recommendations of the Clean Water Board once this gets up and running. That's, 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 yeah. So, we get so this is a cycle. structure. Yes. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Does this have okay. to be out today? Yep. This is a stormwater. It has to go across the hall. The rate it's going, we, we, they will not get it until Wednesday, and they have to have it out by Friday. This is, a, this is an example of what happens when stormwater goes down the hill fast and you can't deal with it. Because right. It washes right through committees of jurisdiction and goes where it wants on. Control. Well, it will go across the hall, and I have, uh, you know, I have a feeling it will end up in that final allocation mix of the budget. Uh, well, if they don't, if, if they want to get rid of the governor's plan to use the estate tax, then they have an eight million dollar hole in the budget, and. Theoretically, we should be helping them fill that void, right? Well, once they get to looking at the budget and seeing how the other body either has or has not filled that hole, I don't know now how the administration filled that hole. I know some of the cuts that have been made I'm uncomfortable with, but um, I think they're still figuring out how the parts are moving in the budget. Once they do that, if they don't have the money, we have a miscellaneous tax bill. They, they will tell us if they need to raise money, and we will raise it. Well, somewhere, as the Revenue Committee, if you're changing the rates for the estate tax as part of this process, yeah. that should be this jurisdiction. It should. It yes. Clearly is. Yeah, I believe it's a, have, that's a revenue bill, so it will start in the in house. You know, if they will ship it over to us, or they may just kill it. But that doesn't mean that we can't take it back up in the miscellaneous tax. In the miscellaneous tax bill, it will be there as something they struck in that bill if that's what they decide to do. The miscellaneous tax bill is our Christmas tree, and it is traditionally where this committee does most of its work at the end of the session, because that's when all those moving parts start to coalesce, and we know what we need to keep them all together. Okay, 
other questions about the bill from Mr. O'Grady? Okay. Thank you. All right. So, committee, we can pass this out. Yes, we can pass it out without recommendation, which I don't feel like I've had enough time to. Yeah, well, that's my motion. Yeah. Okay. Sir Clark, are you ready? Okay, we have a motion from Senator to Campion the bill recommendation. without recommendation. Okay, is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. No. One, so that's six. I'll one. say no also. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, two, zero. All right. Well, maybe as Senator Sirach has suggested, the bill should be retitled as an act uh, relating to not establishing a critical assessment. Or I, there's Chris Pearson I also has. Yeah, I thought it could be vote. possibly one day establishing a water assessment. This has probably been one of the hardest things to crack. I am not happy that we're still limping along with present funds, but. But I feel confident, maybe I'm being a hatred that we're going to get somewhere in it between the House and conference and our further conversations about I think this. So. I mean, we have to. It, it's a, have to. A, the system is complicated. B, that makes the funding complicated. I think this committee has demonstrated in the past that we're willing to raise funds. I don't know at this point that we even know how much we have to raise because there's an eight million dollar at least appropriation in there that is not decided at this point um, or not decided without knowing the cost. So, Senator Campion, you want to report this? It's a real hard one. Okay. Okay. Um, we're going to go on to another really easy, fun one, 131, our insurance sandbox. I'm assuming that everything else in the insurance bill is fine, except the sandbox. And yesterday, we sent a message, I think about quarter or five, over to the Attorney General's office, asking what they thought. Um, this had come back to us with, oh yeah, I wanted to tell you guys about this. Uh, come back to us about with um, the fence. They said they thought they'd do in rules, but lots of fences put around the sandbox. There was some concern about national letters and um, for a national proposal that had been handed out. The insurance agents who had originally been concerned are now happy with the bill as we written. But we asked the Attorney General at 5 o'clock last night um, if they could give us any enlightenment. And Chris, you want to tell us if you can enlighten us? Absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christopher Curtis. I'm the Chief of the Public Protection Division at the Office of the Attorney General. Uh, here to share with you the eight most feared uh, words in the English language. I'm from the government, and I'm here to help. Uh, unfortunately, in this particular instance, we have not had enough time uh, for our office to thoroughly consider this proposal that is before you. So we cannot take a position at this time on the bill. Um, I very much appreciate you flagging it for our attention, and we will uh, re certainly thoroughly review the proposed legislation and take that into account uh, if and when we elect to make any kind of uh, determination about it. Um, but unfortunately, we just have not had time, uh, the Attorney General has not had time enough to really absorb this and, and make a determination about whether or if um, there are questions, concerns, or, or comments that might be useful to your committee. So I, I regret to uh, pass that on to the committee at this point. However, we are aware of it now and we'll certainly follow uh, the bill. So if, it, if you get some real red flags that we're missing, you could 
We will okay. thoroughly work the other body. You fill. Okay. So. Can I ask? So here. Yep. All right. So your office signed on to this letter from that's, I guess, led by the New York Attorney General around. Is this a federal proposal? Yes, this involves, there's, I think what Senator Pearson is referring to is a is letter to the Consumer uh, Financial Protection Bureau involving no action letters um, with respect to, I, I would say that um, I'd like to distinguish the letter that you're looking at from the legislation that's before you for a wide variety of reasons. First of all, uh, that letter specifically dealt with goods and services uh, under the CFPB that would have a direct impact on um, essentially all of the Title IX goods and services that we deal with in terms of unfair or deceptive acts or practices. Um, that is a wide-ranging uh, variety of things. The no action letters referred to uh, in the regulatory sandbox or waiver provisions associated with that um, would actually go on in perpetuity. Um, and they also would potentially uh, one of the objections raised by the Attorney General would it would potentially give some uh, third party immunity or protection from liability for potentially whole industries or trade associations. So it's a very broad sweeping proposal at the federal level that the Attorneys General are um, objecting to there uh, and requesting that those rules not be promulgated. Um, by contrast, I think what's before you is a, an insur frankly, an, an insurance uh, Bill. So, um, because that's the, that is the particular province of the Attorney's General with, with respect to consumer protection writ large, that was a special concern, I think, to the Attorney's General to sign up to that letter. Thank you. We're very fair. These were just handed out. There was no explanation yeah, no. as to what they were. We're just stuck. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Rickenberg, yesterday, and I, or maybe it's Mr. Gaffney, um, a question came up, there are exclusions in this bill, and the question was raised by Mr. Rickenberg as we were going out the doors. Um, could this be workers' comp? Or is, come on up, yeah. Is, is that one of, I know health insurance is excluded, uh. Yes, uh, Kevin Gaffney, uh, Deputy Commissioner of the VFR. Uh, workers' comp is not currently ex contemplated in the bill as an ex exclusion. That being said, it doesn't seem like a likely candidate for, for, for the sandbox um, because there's obviously some pretty rigid state laws, mostly in Title 21. Um, so we could consider we could consider that. I mean, that's something we just discussed. But that was one of the things we talked about. The, the reason we didn't exclude it was that we did think that there could be innovative products. One of the challenges with workers there's a couple of challenges with workers' comp. One, there's still an underserved market. Uh, there's a lot of uh, exemptions that are that avail people to exempt themselves from the system, and they certainly have every right if they're within the law to do that. A lot of that is more cost-driven than finding the benefit of the workers' comp protection. Um, could there be a more innovative workers' comp product that comes to market at a lower cost to serve some of these underserved markets? That potential is there. Um, could there be an innovative product that integrates uh, payroll? Because uh, workers' comp is based on your payroll and the type of work you do. So could there be an integrated product that builds weekly that maybe makes comp a more affordable product. You know, these are just the, the, the type of innovations that you just don't know what you're um, not availing yourself to. But that being said, I, we don't anticipate that being the thrust of the sandbox. I would say most of this being property casualty. Property right? casualty, general. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it is property casualty, yeah. but it's but it's obviously a a. a, a, a the regulatory uh, regime for workers' comp is both in the labor law and in the insurance law. Okay, so committee. So where, is, where are the exceptions in here? Uh, um, last night. Um, page four. 
Play 19, if I got the right spot. Yeah. And there's a whole lot of numbers of blessed you're in a train. <coughs> It excludes chapter 107, 112, 129, and 139, which I have down as health insurance, licensing requirements, consumer protections. I'm not sure what the fourth one is, but. Life yeah, life health insurance, health. Uh, life and health. insurance rate and practices yeah, is 129 and the uh, licensing. Is there, is there another? Is an easy way to just put workers' comp in there, or is it so complicated that it, 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 it's not its own chapter, but it is part of the chapter? So we could we okay. Could, we could identify it as a, whatever it is. We could identify it and carve it out. Okay. What's your preference? I think what I I think what I what I testified to is that the likelihood of comp being a, a suitor is probably lower than other types of products, and that's only based on the experience that we've had to date. Like when we when we engage in some of these innovative uh, presentations, there they haven't been about workers' comp. But what I thought you said but there, that there is that potential because there is a need for innovative products to serve an underserved part of the market. Exactly, and that's what I think uh, I think all of the committee members have raised different questions of give us examples, and I think the example I give is certainly a plausible one. I mean, there are individual, there's individuals that don't carry a cop because either the law allows or there's ambiguity. And Bloggers? Could you remind the new members? I know it's a big problem with oh, bloggers. Who they might be? I wonder if, we, if the witness would remind the members of the committee that they've served here before on what the exemptions are that are being referred to. The exemptions. Well, the exemptions in this bill? In this no, bill. In to workers' comp. Oh, to workers' comp. Well, that's, that's Title 21. That's not our title, but I, we, we have, certainly are familiar with it. So, I mean, Section 601.14.F deals with uh, the definition of employee and uh, well F is specific to sole proprietors and then there's a whole host of requirements mm -hmm. that a sole proprietor could comply with. There's actually six requirements. Is independent contractors? And, right. Yes. Well, independent contract is not actually a de defined okay. term in the law. They're actually so. sole proprietors, I guess. Yes. Yes. All right. Correct, and you know, there's they have to hold themselves out, and they, they can't be at the direction of control. The nature of what they do has to be separate and distinct. Uh, they have it has to be part of a written contract. I guess I do know a little bit about yeah. this. Yeah, it is. Um, it is. But it the is biggest a... tripping point is the written contract. Oftentimes, yeah, there isn't a written contract, so they then are deemed a statutory employee, and so the hiring entity is then responsible. So this has been. One of the probably the most contentious sections of this is the one I think we spent the most time on, probably health and welfare or economic development, is proper classification um, because workers' comp is expensive. And then you get into competition and the unfair advantage, um, workers who don't realize they're not covered and aren't, and so I don't know. For the yeah, I don't know. If, I mean, yeah. it, it's a two-edged sword. If you could come up with an innovative project that would make it more affordable, you would have less incentive to try and find ways to get under the rules. Um, but there would be some risk involved in that. Um, and maybe for the first go round, because we are dealing with injured workers, we might want to think about excluding that. The well, disability insurance. That's uh, part of part health. of health. That'll be hazardous. In terms of auto insurance, that's it, right? It is. So. We spent hours and hours developing policies of policy limits 
what would stop a commissioner from coming along and saying, I can lower premiums and reach some people who are not getting it now by lowering the limits of coverage? Yeah, you still have to comply with the, uh, the motor vehicle law. That's a motor vehicle law. That's, that's, that's a motor vehicle law? That's not an insurance law. It's a motor vehicle law. Title 23. Yeah. So, so this would that would this would not uh, undo any mandated coverage. You know, financial responsibility in the case of auto insurance. Also, uninsured motorist <laughs> coverage in the case of auto insurance. All those things would have to be afforded per the the motor vehicle law. I think we all know that if you just didn't insure things or insure them at a low rate, you could be it's costly. I'm it's not seeing that as the purpose of this bill, just saying, well, you can only get $100 worth of liability on your car. The reason we put those regulations there is to make sure that people are protected. I'll give you a good example for auto insurance. The, the millennials, as I, I think I mentioned the other day, you know, they really don't purchase and own okay. as, you know, in their 30s, that traditionally as other generations have, and um, so, but they, are, are they in vehicles? Certainly they are. They're not in vehicles they own. They're in rental cars, they're in Ubers, they're, and there's there are protections maybe in the TNC world, but in being in someone else's car, a friend's car, um, they don't, if they don't choose to carry what's called a non-owned policy, which means I don't own a car, I want to buy a liability, which is very expensive in the traditional market right now, then they go without coverage. So could a carrier come up with a non-owned auto liability product that is, is maybe uh, on the go? It's when they, when they are renting a car or when they are, uh, you know, going to have a need for a vehicle, um, provide protection for them. That limit of that policy is going to have to comply with the motor vehicle law. And this would go through your standard insurance agents, right? I mean, it, I'm thinking of because we went through this. If the kid at the, at the rent a car had to be in a, you know licensed as an insurance agent, as he says, would you like to get automobile insurance? He knows nothing about what my automobile insurance covers, and we exempted him. Um, but on this one, it would be a standard insurance product, and you would be buying it through, well, maybe you buy it online. You buy it through any source you can buy today, yeah. you know, All which right. is, it could be self-directed uh, online, right. it could you be an uh, 800 it. number, it could be an agent. Um, there's a whole, and, and I think consumers uh, value all those sources. I think millennials, we were just having a conversation. They, they use the internet to educate themselves, but when they really want the security of making the decision, they often still want to talk to somebody. Yeah. I think it was you said yesterday that you have the ability to do some of this today and you can waive certain things for products that come your way. So can you help me understand why you're not just doing that? Well, we, 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 I, think there's a, I think the commissioner testified to this. Uh, you know, we really think this creates a more even level playing field. Um, it allows for um, more structure than, the, than that would, would currently exist. We have kind of a, a, an existing law that would be now there for innovators, for insurance innovators, uh, insurance carriers um, to work with them. A lot of times what, what the challenge is, the innovators don't come to the regulators, <laughs> they just look at the law and say, I, don't, I can't do that. So we don't, even, we don't even get exposed to that. So I, I think there's an opportunity for an innovator to find out. The regulators aren't going to say yes on all of these. There's more no's than yeses typically in these in this process, but what it does is allows us regulators to really look at the details behind it, and actually, by by doing that, 
have better consumer protection by looking at this in, in greater depth and having the reporting. Remember, it's not just right. getting issued a sandbox license, but there's actually a reporting mechanism. The carrier who's issued a license is issued the license and they just go on and do their business and the only, you know, our engagement with them is just if there's consumer consumer issues. And there is a cash or security set and aside a, and so that if something goes wrong, there's a protection for the consumer. Um, and there's a two year limit, so it's yeah, it's a twelve month with a with a with a you know yeah. a, a, where the where the the applicant can apply for a twelve month extension. Where is your authority to do that? Well, I think there's there's uh, there are uh, just certain that, just a statutory sign. Of any specific, uh, you know, statutory site, other than I can give you like an example of, you know, for traditional licensure, you you're required to meet certain financial requirements. Um, but we also have a seasoning requirement in in for company licensing. That's five years of profitability. And that is something that we, if we had, if someone had four years, but we thought maybe the product was going to pr provide it to an underserved market, we could do that, right? That's what I'm looking for, the authority to do that. I mean, if you have a requirement of law and there's no counter valid authority, you can't do that. Where is the authority to do it? I have a feeling, having written some of those laws, that we have you know, there's that phrase or at the commissioner's discretion that yeah, well, gets added there is, on. There is. I don't have those at the ready, but there are. There is it, it would take there. a while to find them. I don't think there's one law that says the it's not. like the rulemaking authority is frequently set aside. So it may be that in certain instances he has, there's that discretion, yes. but this would give it a much broader situation. And when we gave it before, we gave it in those specific situations right. by the General Assembly. Now, without looking any specifically, we're giving broad authority across all of these laws that we struggle to pass. I don't know that we're giving it that broad of an authority. You can't change licensure. You can't change any consumer protections. There's still, and there, there's all kinds of time limits. I don't see it as wide open. Yes, we're, we're no. giving them permission in this, and I keep getting the image of the TV commercial, I think it's Capital One, you know, this was your old bank with the white gothic pillars and the tellers, and we're creating the new bank, and they clear all this stuff out, and you can now do all your banking online. Um, that's the millennials. My husband still goes down and personally pays bills. My son is outraged if he can't pay a bill online and has to put a stamp on it. There's just a whole new way. I'm still getting used to people getting mortgages online uh, with I would never think of making that kind of a huge investment with somebody I have never met, never seen, and frequently there's seven or eight somebody's involved. But in a, we don't know what's out there. Well, I just, I just want to, you know, if you don't mind, just what the potential outcome of this is after the sandbox period is what? At the end, we, we find out that the applicant isn't going to continue their product in the market. That's one. Two, now they are able to actually graduate and actually get a, a, a traditional company license, or we identify something that requires a law change, and then we come to the legis you know, and, and then we decide, okay, this seems like a product that is actually serving a market that hadn't been previously served. The law, our current uh, uh, regime, doesn't allow for it, and then we decide whether we want to launch it. And 
And then we have the ability as a legislature right. to weigh in on your recommendation and whether you agree with that or not. And change the law. Now, this, as I understand it, will be the only law of this type in the country. Is that correct? As far as you for, for, insurance, insurance. for insurance, for insurance, regulatory sandbox. Right. So that gives us, again, a competitive advantage to begin with. Now, one of the things that we talked about yesterday is the possibility of monetizing in some way uh, the uh, participation of someone in it in the development of a product that ultimately can, can become nationwide, much like a, a provider of patent assistant might have to somebody in the intellectual uh, development uh, business. And I had asked uh, the commissioner yesterday to perhaps come to us today with some language that uh, either creates a study or some mechanism for that to do it. I'm wondering if you can have that, that language. We, we do. This is Jill Rickard, uh, Director of Policy with CFR. And we did come up with some language, which I've sent over to Maria um, to do a study of monetization. And I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, the language that we discussed was the Department of Financial Regulation shall study the feasibility of requiring a person who offers a product or service in Vermont pursuant to an innovation waiver to agree to pay the state a small fee or royalty based on the subsequent successful licensing and or sale of such product or service in one or more other states. Something to that extent is what you had in mind. We'd be happy to look into that study. I'm a big fan of raising money, but I gotta say, the first, my first reaction to that was, Let's give a, a percentage to policemen for issuing tickets. <laughs> well, there's a balance in terms of how you structure something like this so that you don't have a regulator in a conflict of interest position of uh, doing something regarding modernization. So the actual wording of this, you know, I, I would ask legislative council perhaps to look at just with that background in mind as to how we word something like this so that we at least anticipate that issue. But if we're taking a risk in doing the inspection <coughs> and doing the oversight, and it might. John, it's worth thinking about. I'm not uh, against innovation. I know, you know, this is a creative thinking, but I'm really concerned about the unintended consequences and this getting in the wrong hands. And I'm also concerned, quite frankly, that once this bill passes, even with a sunset, it's very likely to continue. Uh, it'll get less scrutiny, I think, in a couple of years. And I look at these, all these statutes and all these bulletins of regulations that were scrutinized very carefully. I don't know what's in them, but it seems like in the wrong hands, they can be weighed, even with the fences we put up around us. And it's just, I wouldn't take the risk nationally. I think the commissioner said he wouldn't take the risk nationally. To me, this, the one thing Vermont can do because of our small size and because everybody is somebody's cousin is we, we're there's no arm's length here, and my thought is, if something starts to go seriously wrong, and I doubt you're going to have something come in and sell 10,000 policies in this state. I, I'm not sure AAA sells 10,000 policies in this state. Um, that we will know very quickly if strange things are happening down in the city center. And we can put a stop to it. We can have the governor do an order. We can have a special session. We'll be back in session. And usually just a warning. I mean, I, I, to me, it, it's, 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 a, it's a balancing. But I, I, I have no reason, after an awful lot of years, not to trust the Department of Financial Regulation to regulate. That's what they've done. That's why captives like us, because we regulate. And based on what I'm seeing here, I'm, I'm comfortable that 
as we balance the risk reward uh, ratio or the fulcrum between the two that this is a, a prudent risk because we have a, a department of the regulatory agency that's capable of managing the risk and the risk is not of sufficient magnitude that it gives me great concern. When they are done, is it possible for us to have John Holler come back up since he was the one that gave us the original list of all the... Yeah, I'm, keep... I'm ready to swear you are, okay. Because I just feel like we got this list from him and then he testified yesterday and he said that, if I don't want to put words in his mouth, no. but I'd love to get that back on the record that felt like... Yes. That what we've got in this list, list that we've got all the letters that from that all, that all the attorneys is, general that exactly. so are not... not I just saying. want to remind people of that, that it's not that we're ignoring this. We're, we're going back to the source who have brought this to our attention. I just, I, we can disagree, but I would like to. That, that's fine. He's not the source of state laws. No, no, no. no. He's not. the one that brought I, I think this is a list of state insurance this laws. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's, you know. OK. Are we finished? Mm -hmm. Well, did you John, you want to come on up? Talk to us. You seem to, in defense of your clients, spread a lot of fear in this committee. <laughs> um, and would you not like to see if you could settle down uh, yeah, some of that so, fear? So, no, I appreciate it. John Holler, uh, Dan Tucker Martin here from the Hefty Vermont Insurance Agents Association. So, you know, I was, uh, my client raised concern at a pretty high level about this bill. And as a result of that, I raised concerns with others and, with, and presented the committee with that list, which I thought was relevant. I mean, if you're going to consider this broad scope, I thought that it would be relevant for you to see the actual list of uh, But those. that is a list of all the insurance oh. regulations and in the state. And statutes it? that would be subject yeah. to waiver. That's all the stuff. That's what it was. And right. So that was the what it was. Well, that doesn't exclude anything that the bill excludes at this point. Uh, it does. I think we I, I carved out from that the, I didn't include on that list the statutes and the indulgence that would be subject to, <laughs> that wouldn't okay. be subject to waiver. Um, subsequent to that, my client had some very productive conversations with the staff at, and I think the commissioner at the department and as a result, as I testified the other day, or maybe yesterday, they narrowed significantly the scope of the authority, both in terms of what can be waived and how long, um, and I, from that, reached a level of comfort that it's not open-ended. Uh, and I think that time, well, I think probably in both senses, both the, the, the definition of what can be waived and the standards, but also the duration, uh, so that it's one year, and I think it can be extended a year, had a significant impact on their ability to be comfortable with it. So as a result, um, they are, are comfortable with what's before you. So I hope that's helpful. And you represent um, insurance, 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 insurance agents. agents. Yes. Okay. Have you read all these? No, I'm, no, I. That's <laughs> no. I definitely have not. Michael, read them. Michael's working at it. What I want to tell you is a, a sense of what is subject to waiver, and it is a lot. But and so that's what triggered their I think alarm at the outset, mm -hmm. because what they didn't have is to overwork the phrase an adequate set of fences around right. this sandbox. And I think after those discussions, uh, they felt like there really was uh, adequate. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at things like repeal 1971, number 185, adjourned session, number 237, effective March 29th, 1972. I don't, I mean, th that's just a list some computer generally. It was. I don't, I don't know what be, you're waving in there. Well, I, I, I didn't mean to suggest that, that those were seriously going to be considered waiver. What I wanted to give you was a list of all the There's statutes, insurance statutes that would be subject to waiver. Yeah. Something Obviously, tells me we're going to get many, a really bad organization. But they're all, they're all subject to waiver, and that was really the only yeah. point of that. So, so, so John and I have done a lot of battle over the years over workers' comp. Do you have any uh, problems with exempting workers' comp from this law? Uh, my clients wouldn't have any problem exempting that from that. No, you mean in, temp, in terms of not allowing the department to have a waiver, sir? No. No. Or would that work as cop carrier, sir? No. Oh, we don't. No. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's the reason. In this building, we did at one point. Yeah, yeah, it might have been. No, I mean, I think, as Mr. Shafton pointed out, most of the underlying statutes 
is the government of workers' comp system where it's under Title 21, not Title 8. So it really, I think, needs really deal. I mean, the insurance department mostly focuses on solvency and carriers, not the actual benefits of the club comp claims. So but when this discussion originally started, it was insurance in case you lost your camera on a hike, um, insurance for uh, perhaps being on an airplane flight that got in late enough so, late enough so you missed your Caribbean cruise, um, you, missed, you lose your fishing pole while in fishing, um, and they all, all the examples were you listened and you went, oh, well, that's an interesting insurance policy, but where does this list end? And um, I can't imagine that insurance companies that are monitored can make a living on, on those sort of, sort of things. Your TV goes sour during the, your Super Bowl party insurance. Oh, but, um, so, or your dip goes sour. But anyway, um, th this, this is Mickey Mouse stuff, which is selling something that could end up being <laughs> Kong stuff, not Mickey Mouse stuff. So, um, where's the where's the line? Well, I think you'd have to look at the scope, and I think from our view, the scope, of the definition of what is subject to waiver narrows it to the point where I think it would address not mainstream policies. But I mean, if you make your attention about that, but I think we were comfortable that it's narrow enough that that's it's not going to. Be broadly used um, to exempt general, you know, sort of the non insurance policies. Would it make the committee more comfortable if we asked the commissioner to give us an interim report of what's been requested, what's been accepted, what's been denied? January 2020. 2020. So we will know. Um, my biggest fear is we aren't going to get anything. Um, but we will know what kind, if it's Mickey Mouse or if it's Moby Dick that's come in for a waiver. You lose your fish and pole there. Yeah, I mean, but we, we will at least get, this is, you know, we'll at least get, that'll be probably six months in, um, an idea of if there's a whole bunch of insurance companies waiting out there to rip off the Vermonters, or maybe we're getting no response, or maybe we're getting a very limited deer fishing pole or spraining your back marlin fishing um, or bungee jumping. I mean, yeah. who knows? But would that make it better? At least we know what we were authorizing. Mm -hmm. That'd be much At least we know what we were authorizing. And, yep. And, uh, okay. So this Goodness knows when you buy insurance, there's three pages of fine print on what you have on what has been on this, this says conspicuous. This would just be asking you to report back to us January of next year the number, the time, I'm not sure how much confidentiality, okay. Um, how much confidentiality you have, but it, you know, the, the number, the uh, type, what brief description? Pardon? It is in the bill for next January. Oh, you're just changing the timing of the report. I apologize. I think we would. Uh, I think the committee is very concerned that we're opening the gate, and they're not sure if Mickey Mouse or Moby Dick's going to come through, and if somebody's going to be asking to make major changes in uh, liability insurance. So, you know. Um, or I think some of us are thinking maybe we're too, you know, maybe we won't get any takers. But either way, just you can do this as a verbal. I don't need yeah, a 10 page. It's in the bill, uh, January 15, 2020. Page seven. Page seven. Okay, so the so twice yeah. a year beginning. Okay, yeah. so we're going to get a report yes. in January yes. as to the activity. All well, right. I'm sure the timing, but I thought it was. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Do we have any other questions for Mr. Holler? Thank you very much. Mickey Bird, you want to speak to us? Anybody else want to speak? Cowards. <laughs> David Mickenberg on behalf of uh, a few organizations, AARP Vermont, 
and the Vermont Association for Justice. Um, just so you know, we've sent the bill down to ARP's uh, insurance expert who is taking a look at it, and we'll get back to you, um, ARP's perspective on it, looking at it now. Um, uh, but as you know, ARP is a consumer protection organization that cares deeply about protecting consumers, 140,000 members of Vermont. So, um, from the from the Vermont Association for Justice, um, I'm, I'm glad uh, Mr. Holler's not fearful anymore. That sort of makes me fearful in some ways because <laughs> uh, uh, oftentimes there's this yin yang uh, in the issues we work on. I just my concern one I raised with you yesterday about workers' comp, but also related to liability insurance. When we see the practitioners that I work with see catastrophic injuries. And the uncertainty and unknown about an insurance product that may or may not cover them, and, um, uh, and how it covers them, and the intricacies of it um, is disconcerting to us. And we're in the process of analyzing this bill as well. But it just certainly raises some, given the amount of, um, I don't say turmoil, the amount of conflict that we have naturally built into the system as it pertains to seriously injured individuals in the civil justice system, knowing that insurance products could now be uh, innovative in that world um, raises some concern. Uh, so, um, you know, when you might hear back from folks, sounds like they're both, both, you're both working. Working. Not by 5 o'clock today. Not by 5 o'clock today, but um, certainly I appreciate the openness to exempting workers' comp. I think that's uh, it's helpful, but even beyond that, um, Okay. Yeah, I understand the point. I'm not against innovation. You know, cell phone needs some innovative insurance coverage for cell phone, lost cell phone or something like that. But when it comes to catastrophic injuries to individual sure my passwords. Yeah, that that is an area where yeah. we have some okay. questions. So. Well we've got a couple options. We can Thank you. strip out this section and send out the rest of a fairly innocuous bill. We can leave this in um, with the safeguards we've got. The insurance agents that actually work on the ground floor, and it's their licenses that are on the line, feel comfortable. If AARP or the Association for Justice, I require capes next time you come in, um, come up with some really severe concerns. We can amend, you know, we can do an amendment on the floor to address those. Or if it's really serious, we can, we can strip it on the floor. But I don't think we're going to be able to make any more progress this afternoon. I think it's time. And at this point, Unless we want to have Maria go draft something that strips out workers' comp, or we just wait and see if any of those folks that are looking at this, along with the Attorney General, come running in here next Tuesday and say, oops, um, then we can do that all at once and not have to wait for Maria to go. We ask also if Maria could address the addition regarding monetization uh, language, uh, so that when we come back to this, we do okay. It. May, you want to do that as a floor amendment rather than wait for her to? Well, again, is if the likelihood is that there may be some change to this anyway right. next week, uh, and we're going to look at it again next yeah. week, we probably ought to do it then and do an amendment then, and yeah, she'll have just, time. Just you know, put it in yeah. the, in the bill as, as it comes to us to vote on. Okay, and we'll get we'll get the amendments in the calendar on the floor if there are any. Yep. Yours, I think, we'll look at as um, we'll have you do it on behalf of the committee or whatever makes <laughs> secretary happy. Okay, so committee, what do you want to do? I was I wasn't opposed to doing a study, but we're going to do we're going to do it. I wasn't supposed to study it. Coming back next session when it was tidied up and battened down. Well, I think they feel that this, the study is you have to test the market and see if there's a market. 
I mean, they, they're, what I've heard that the department saying is they won't know until they get there and what if anything's done, out there. And they've done sufficient study to establish a control environment with which they feel comfortable. We just move forward without the same sandbox provision. Just one vote. Okay. I'm looking for a motion or something. No, I'd like to keep it in. I'd like to keep it in also. So I'll, I'll move that we uh, move the bill forward with the sandbox provision intact, you know, subject to these amendments that we're, we're talking about and subject to obviously to the, to the review. Okay. I'm just looking, Maria, have we done anything that we need to, we have not made any changes to this, have we? No, not since, uh, we went over the latest draft yesterday. The latest draft. And there have been no subsequent revisions. So if we vote draft 1.1, .1, or do we have to amend, the day before that. strike it, and I've been yeah, seeing it done both the, ways. That's we have to amend the bill with That's what I thought. Health and welfare has been just doing moving well, draft one committee one. one. Does. Okay, so <coughs> Brock, with your motion to strike the bill and replace it with draft one point one. Which is what was brought to us yesterday. Amend the bill. Button. Amend the bill. Strike all amendments. Which was the the bill with the fences that was brought to us yesterday. No. Thank is that your amendment? Do we have a motion? 321. Yeah. That is your motion? Okay, so we are striking, the bill is introduced and substituting, strike all amendment, draft 1.1. 322. 31419 is the date on it. We've been, what? Yesterday. Yesterday. Oh, yesterday. 